We're pleased to make available this video presentation by Rod Bly to the Institution of Structural Engineers in May this year. Bly Tanner has been fortunate enough to work with many artists, architects, fabricators, and other collaborators in this creative endeavor. And these pivotal people and companies are credited at the end of this talk. The presentation is aimed at inspiring young structural engineers to seek inspiration in the world around them and to bring a broad set of skills to all projects. We hope you enjoy. This presentation was made to the Institution of Structural Engineers in Brisbane this year. Blytana has had the good fortune to be involved in public art installations since the inception of the business about 30 years ago. There's been a great synergy between this area, area of our practice and our work in the general building industry. Experience and knowledge in a wide variety of materials, structural systems and analysis and modeling techniques have crossed over with specialist areas in our practice, such as facade engineering, which have grown out of our work with glass and aluminium in art installations. A rewarding aspect of our work in sculpture and art has been the value that we were able to bring to the process through our knowledge of construction processes, which artists are not so familiar with when working at a larger scale. In the general building industry, we are part of a team of professionals, including architects and builders, who also contribute this knowledge. Like all our areas of work in structures, whether it be with heritage, conservation, sustainable and innovative new um, university buildings, transport infrastructure or facades, the key to successful contribution is open and creative thinking backed by a very thorough technical understanding and capability. When we talk about creativity and um, and influences in our design at, at Bly Tanner. One thing that is always stressed is that to keep an open mind and to observe the, the world around us, which is full of, of different examples, which can uh, lead to um, bringing ideas into the projects that we're working on at a particular time. One very early um, art installation of ours, or at least a public uh, installation in a, in a creative way was the, um, was the uh, presentation of three maritime objects at the Kangaroo Point walkway back in 1992. Uh, prior to working on this project, uh, I'd been uh, a few years previous, I'd been cycling in Italy uh, with an architect friend and we uh, chanced upon the Castelvecchio Museum in Verona, uh, which, is, which is by um, the famous Italian architect Carlo Scarpa. <clears throat> This museum has since become uh, an exemplar in the world for how to present uh, museum objects uh, in a way that responds to that object itself. Uh, we spent a lot of time looking at this and that, that was certainly top of my mind when I was given the opportunity to work on the, on the uh, installation of these three maritime objects at Kangaroo Point. Uh, with the propeller, as you can see, it was suspended from a, a spindle through the shaft, which was uh, responding to the way that the, the propeller would work in, in action. Uh, with, the, with the anchor, because an anchor is suspended from the top, the focus was on, on um, uh, ex uh, exaggerating the way that the, the anchor was pulled up by the hook, and then for the, uh, to stabilize the arms of the anchor, the uh, support structure just reached out and, um, and held the ends of the arms in place around the spherical tips, uh, rather than having a, a fixed support. For the buoy, because buoys are, uh, the dominant action is pulling the buoy down to the, to the seabed ballast, um, the, the, the downward connection was highlighted, once again with a, a big hook through the bottom of the buoy, and then for the upper uh, suspension connection, uh, this was downplayed through uh, connection to the the um, the steel frame flange, which was just uh, the flange was um, broken with a spigot being inserted through the flange, and this this then held a pin which held up the buoy. So in all of these three um, objects, I was trying to think about how uh, how to best. Um, respond to the nature of how those objects would be used in practice in, in their prior life. An important aspect of our, our work with um, uh, with public art installations is knowledge across a range of different structural systems. It's very important to think 
about what the appropriate structural system is uh, when working with the art objects so that the, the art objects can become part of the structure and then that support structure can be minimised. We've done a lot of work with uh, tensile lightweight structures over the years um, and this uh, has given us, um, this comes into our work quite a lot with an understanding of how tensile structures use geometric stiffness for their performance, uh, the use of pre-stressing, um, understanding of wind sensitive structures and also that refinement of, of connection details uh, which is very important um, once again to sort of make the the art object stand out more rather than the um, than the actual cable connection details themselves. In a couple of projects that I've uh, put up here on the screen there's um, a work by the Aboriginal artist uh, sculptor Tony Albert which is at the entry to the Queensland Children's Hospital. In this object, the, um, these timber boomerangs, which are derived from a cross boomerang, which is used as a play element in uh, Aboriginal communities in North Queensland, where Tony is from, um, they're uh, connected together at their tips and uh, um, with the illusion that they're uh, flying through the air. Uh, initially, this structure was to be that conceived to be supported, uh, sort of suspended from the ceiling above, but that was not possible by the time the building was finished. So uh, we we're able to derive uh, a, a system which had minimal support off the circular columns and had the, the array of, of um, cross timber boomerangs which uh, connect to each other and form part of a, I guess, a three dimensional space structure um, with, the, um, with three stabilizing struts and then cable suspension. On the lower um, installation is uh, called Box Kite and it um, once again uses an array of cables um, to, to support the, the, um, the wing elements of the kite. Uh, these cables in the way that they uh, cross each other in three dimensions. They form a, an interesting net which both suspends the wing elements as well as stabilizes them. Some other projects which where different structural systems are considered is this uh, on the left hand side is a Barbara Heath installation that uh, was at Central Plaza in um, Brisbane CBD called I think a rock a cloud and a tree and in this project there was some very expensive uh, mirrored titanium sort of gold mirrored titanium plates that were imported from Japan uh, and they needed to suspend out as the cloud element so rather than um, having uh, extremely expensive thick steel uh, plate to um, to create that uh, that overhang we used two uh, five millimeter thick plates which were much cheaper and then um, pin them together with an array of, of pins which enable those two steel plates to act as a, as a composite structure. In the middle structure, which is um, uh, installed uh, down in a, in a um, CBD foyer in, in Melbourne, <coughs> this, um, this structure is um, effectively like a three-dimensional bicycle wheel with the, the hub being the, the beaten stainless steel, six millimeter stainless steel sphere, uh, and then uh, uh, spokes, which are just um, pinned into the stainless steel sphere, which support a, a two layer lattice structure on the outside, which is like the rim of the wheel. So in this structure, everything, there, there's no, um, no bending elements. It's all in, all elements are uh, taking axial tension or compression. Uh, which is, uh, enables us to keep all the, the connections and the member sizes um, minimised. But once again, to, to, to be able to conceive this kind of structure, you need to understand how in practice it can potentially work um, to then aim for a, a minimal structure. The um, Gallery of Modern Art in, in Brisbane has a uh, sculpture that was developed by a, a New Zealand uh, artist who um, uh, called the Horn of Africa. In this one, a steel structure which was in within the seal supports uh, a um, a mock uh, grand piano. Uh, for this, to make the um, the base structure for the grand piano, 
a, a composite panel was introduced, which is made up of a balsa wood floor and uh, two skins of, of fiberglass on either side. Uh, these panels were sourced from a, um, a company on the Gold Coast that makes panels for, uh, for lightweight uh, racing ocean yachts. Um, so we're able to uh, identify this as being a, a good lightweight stiff material that the, the rest of the Grand Piano could be built around. Structural system that's come up a few times recently is these uh, conic forms. Um, uh, the one on the left is for the festival gardens in Adelaide, so uh, which is to support a, um, as you can see, is to support um, some vines which will grow up to form a, an arbor. This type of structure, rather than working as just a cantilever bending structure, it's important to to recognise that. Uh, it's actually uh, the primary actions are a combination of, of uh, radial tensions and compressions, um, which are resisted by the hoop stresses that go around the structure. So once this, this understanding of how the structural system is most efficiently going to work, we can then start uh, adding structure to so, uh, as required to, make, to, um, to enable that, um, that three dimensional action to occur, and to, which enables us to keep the size of all the members down. Uh, the, the project on the right was for a um, weatherproof canopy of glass to support a, an open area between two heritage buildings at a, at a homestead. Um, the the um, image on the top there shows the kind of thinking that the, um, the um, sculptural um, lead designers were thinking of but uh, you can see that it, it really had to be rationalized into something uh, which is just shown on the bottom there um, where we use the primary uh, steel structure to support a lattice of of uh, once again um, steel structure working as uh, in hoop and radial stresses um, and then to support the, the glass canopy above above that um, secondary structure uh, a lot of our facade engineering skills came into developing a, a system with the uh, with the lead designers to um, to both make the structure efficient and to make it actually work, and to make the uh, the canopy weatherproof. We've done a lot of work with different materials over the years. Uh, all the uh, metals, bronze, aluminium, stainless steel. Um, spending a lot of time looking at how these uh, materials are fabricated, fatigue stresses through the worlds, casting processes, and then how all these different materials can, um, can be combined to form a sculptural installation. Uh, glass, um, glass reinforced concrete, glass fiber reinforced concrete, uh, timber, fiberglass, polycarbonates, and other composite materials. Uh, this project here is called CAMA 2020, and it's recently been revealed to celebrate um, the 250th anniversary of Captain Cook arriving at Botany Bay, and uh, and that obviously that uh, first contact with um, uh, between uh, Captain Cook and and the uh, Aboriginal people of Australia. So um, there was a, a Aboriginal artist working with urban art projects who we do a lot of work with, uh, was engaged to um, design this commemorative piece, which I think that there is also a few other installations down at that Botany Bay site. Um, the, um, this uh, structure is made of a series of, of ribs, which are demonstrative of, um, I guess, the ship's uh, hull, but also of the maritime, the whale kind of uh, skeleton. Uh, which is important to the Aboriginal people, and uh, the, the bronze, the cast bronze, is includes um, carving, um, carving designs. <clears throat> so for the structure, which is uh, mounted on a uh, sloping on the rock platform at the edge of the bay, um, it clearly it was uh, exposed to some pretty intense environmental conditions, and. Um, 
the cast bronze would, would not have been able to take the kind of forces that were involved in that sort of minimal connection into the rock into the rock base. So for this structure, we used a stainless steel armature, which is located inside the sort of bottom half of the ribs, and uh, those that stainless steel structure is then pinned into the into the rock platform. The where the forces were less at the upper points of the of the ribs. Um, just uh, we didn't need the steel, the stainless steel armature at that point, and just had the um, the bronze cast bronze elements bolted to the top of the steel armature. There's a lot of work put in in these kind of structures, put into seeing how um, how fabric how the uh, cast elements are then uh, connected together um, uh, to form the the overall to form the complete piece. On this uh, large structure by Cause, um, who makes these um, figures that have become extremely popular um, and uh, expensive um, iconic art installations that are put up around the world, there's um, this, this five and a half meter high uh, figure. Um, is to be installed down in the Mornington Peninsula. Um, for this one, uh, um, rather than use uh, stainless steel or, or steel um, armature inside the structure, we looked at just using the cast bronze and then by um, analyzing in uh, three-dimensional three uh, finite element analysis uh, in space gas, um, we're able to uh, identify where there were weak points or critical points that required stiffening. And so we're able to then um, modify the thickness of the, the bronze casting in various locations or, uh, or incorporate um, stiffening gussets. Um, in all of this kind of um, analysis, a controlling aspect is the uh, fatigue stress limitations. Uh, that we put on the welded joints of the between the, the cast bronze elements. Um, we th there's no specific Australian standard around fatigue stresses in cast bronze, but we uh, adapt the aluminium code um, on the basis that um, that the cast bronze is is a higher strength than aluminium and also has uh, greater ductility. For this structure, Boy Walking, uh, which was also fabricated by Urban Art Projects in, in Brisbane and then uh, transported to Auckland. Uh, once again, Walking Boy is in the order of five to six metres high. Um, for this structure, which is made out of uh, cast, uh, cast aluminium, uh, particularly with the slender elements like the long arms and long legs, uh, we uh, needed to incorporate a, a stainless steel internal um, structure, which then the um, the cast aluminium segments are connected to, and and then the cast aluminium is welded together. For this structure, I've included a, a picture of the uh, robot that um, Urban Art Projects have been developing, where the uh, the robot is able to take the three dimensional um, computer uh, images and then carve out of uh, the polystyrene the, um, the different elements that make up the, the sculpture. Uh, this, um, this positive model is then uh, used to form, uh, to create the, uh, the moulds for uh, the sand casting process. Um, with the sand casting, um, Urban Art Projects uh, use a sand casting pro process which um, uh, where uh, the uh, plasticine is applied to the first mould uh, and plasticine is put in at various thicknesses as we require from the analysis uh, to form the, um, when the plasticine is then displaced by uh, the molten um, uh, metal, uh, we, we end up with the correct thickness of, of aluminium for the um, stresses, to, to limit the stresses. So, uh, with our work with Urban Art Projects, we've been um, 
developing the use of uh, grasshopper, um, which is grasshopper and rhino. So urban art projects create um, the three-dimensional uh, forms using uh, grasshopper and rhino. And then we use grasshopper to transfer across to the grasshopper add-on in space gas to transfer that three-dimensional model uh, across to space gas. And then we do the final element analysis on, on uh, using the space gas plate uh, elements, uh, which has been uh, that, that space gas capability has improved significantly over the years that we, we now don't need to um, go in. We, we still use uh, strand for um, some of our analysis, but we're finding that space gas has improved to the level where we're up to use, just use that grasshopper transfer. We, um, we uh, undertake our analysis and, and work and go in a back and forward um, process with urban art projects as we modify uh, the model to suit um, the structural uh, efficiency and, and limiting stresses, etc. Uh, we then send models back to uh, urban art projects, um, and we're able to uh, significantly refine the um, refine the design of the structures. For instance, this uh, egg sculpture by Lindy Lee has been refined so that uh, we only have the the steel uh, supporting armature around that open void that you can see. And then the rest of the, um, I think it's about five meter long, uh, two and a half millimeter thick stainless steel egg is formed without any other internal stiffening, which is an important part of the success of the project because um, the two and a half millimeter stainless steel uh, skin is perforated um, to let light uh, both in and, uh, and the egg is also lit uh, so that um, if there'd been an internal structure that would have obviously diminished from the from the success of, the, of what the artist was trying to achieve. In uh, the bottom project here, the Can Citizens Gateway to the Reef, uh, we used once again with urban art projects. Uh, there was a combination of, of stainless steel on the which enabled the highly polished face uh, faces either side um, to be created. And then that stainless steel was welded to um, to normal, uh, normal steel uh, on the other faces. With this structure, because of the high polishing to the surface, um, we, uh, we had to avoid using uh, ribs, internal stiffening ribs that would be welded to the inside face because it could distort the surface and uh, take away from that mirrored effect. Uh, in this case, we did need some um, stiffening because of the height and the thickness of the um, of the, the steel was limited to six millimeters, and the height of the structure and that exposure to cyclonic winds required some internal stiffening. In this case, we used uh, we bonded internal stiffening ribs uh, with structural silicon to avoid welding. We've recently done some structures um, with artists who are keen to use um, uh, GRC, uh, glass fibre reinforced concrete, um, thin concrete elements, uh, which is, a, I guess, a practice which is used for, um, for creating uh, different facade elements in buildings, but it's also, we work with um, these manufacturers who do a lot of the work in creating, um, say, movie sets or um, or movie world kind of installations where they're creating different environments, um, <clears throat> this uh, required a lot of a um, lot of work to create because uh, a number of the elements of this um, uh, model were were um, difficult to achieve or the strength required uh, if it was just made out of uh, GRC. Um, we supported the GRC, um, uh, this, this roof structure that was envisaged by the artist, we supported that on a, on a steel structure below, but then uh, needed to look at how that steel structure would have a flexible uh, connection to the GRC elements, um, taking into account different thermal uh, movement. The, um, the object on the right is uh, 3D printing of polycarbonate. Uh, this is creates um, to create some walls of, um, of polycarbonate, uh, sculptural polycarbonate uh, for a, um, to be installed at um, University Project RMIT. Uh, 
this kind of project, we, we do rely a lot on, on testing uh, because it's such an unknown as to what the uh, structural performance of the, of the 3D printed polycarbonate is going to be. Um, so um, working, particularly working with urban art projects, we, we undertake testing uh, of, to build up our confidence in, in that structural capacity. Um, more on materials, uh, the recent project which I talked about before with um, Tony Albert uh, called Glad Tomorrow uh, relied on interconnectivity of these um, timber elements uh, at their tips and these tips were tapered as much as possible um, to give that aerodynamic shape uh, and the structure was required to um, Tra transmit forces as the timber elements were part of the structure there was a combination of torsion and bending and axial force going through these tip connections um, <clears throat> as you'll know uh, timber the greatest weakness in timber is how to connect it at its ends um, and particularly uh, you know, with that um, tension um, pull out failure uh, parallel with the fibers uh, timber can be quite weak and uh, but the requirement of this project was to put all the force through these narrow tips. So um, we firstly developed a system of connection with dowels drilled up deep into the timber, connected to an RHS spigot, which then took a, a cleat which was welded to these um, fabricated uh, stainless steel balls to form the uh, to form the joints. Uh, initially, the artist was keen on using recycled spotted gum and um, and we, we uh, then commenced to undertake uh, commission some testing of the connections between the spotted gum boomerangs. Um, this, uh, this showed us the failure mode um, which was that uh, shearing through the, the narrow segments as, as expected and uh, particularly with the spotted gum any any defect in that spotted gum um, uh, significantly weakened the uh, lower the capacity of the of the joint. Um, <clears throat> it's certainly the the joint we knew was um, it, it was not able to satisfy a uh, typical Australian standard type of analysis of, of the capacity of those joints. We then uh, moved to a um, to the Hine uh, hardwood glue lamb uh, GL twenty one uh, timber timber structure primarily to avoid. Um, to get away from any um, uh, uh, fault, any um, knot or, or notch or um, natural um, weak, weak point that would occur in the timber. And after, from the testing, we were able to see what the different failure, the critical failure modes were, and we modified, modified the joint so that we um, went to a high very high strength uh, duplex stainless steel to be able to reduce the element, reduce the size of the cleats uh, so that we could increase the thickness of the timber. We made the um, connection, the end connection of the RHS to the timber flexible so that the forces weren't transmitted right at the end. Um, and that, um, that then gave us the confidence to, to proceed. Uh, in this case, we weren't able, the project couldn't afford any further testing, uh, but we had sufficient confidence in, um, in the capacity of this redesigned, uh, improved timber joint to, um, to continue with the project. A lot of the work with um, these installations and, and much of it with, once again, with urban art projects uh, has, um, we've, we also get involved in developing uh, facades, building facades and, uh, and screen elements. Um, the work with screen elements, uh, such as this cast bronze um, screen at, down the bottom right at uh, Anzac Place, Anzac Square in Brisbane, um, this this uh, screen has the names of all the different towns in in Queensland where um, service people uh, think in first and second world war uh, came from. Um, so these screens are obviously form uh, if we're trying to um, create them without a, a backing structure. The screen itself, even though it has so many. Um, 
penetration through it needs to be able to span as a structure between the supports, in this case, between the, the top um, walkway element and the ground support. <clears throat> um, uh, so we we use the um, we use the the, the ability to um, take models, three dimensional models, um, uh, the computer models from space gas uh, uh, from um, urban art projects, convert them to a space gas model, and that gives us an idea of how uh, the structural forces flow between all these discontinuous elements. Um, in, in the case of this um, structure being cast bronze, we also undertook some, uh, some uh, basic load testing just to confirm the computer model um, stiffness and, um, and stress and the, the way it was working uh, through a comparison of the, the um, deflection stiffness in the, in the testing that we undertook. Um, this project at 300 George Street, a uh, very large facade wrap um, using pressed aluminium. Um, concerned with this, uh, with these pressed aluminium uh, components, was the residual stresses that would be um, in in the structure following the pressing process, and then uh, combining that with um, the ability to span between the supporting structure uh, to take uh, wind loading. Uh, so once again, we undertook some testing of those um, of those elements. Um, another project here is a hung, a, a large hung screen within a, a foyer space at Martin Place, um, using um, using a system of uh, cable um, cable structure, which provides the primary support, and then using facade type uh, patch fittings, uh, connecting between those cables and the facade elements. So you can see that there's a, a big crossover here between the kind of work we do with facades. Kind of work we do with with uh, tensile lightweight structures, and then working um, uh, with the um, art installation team to minimise the the um, uh, the amount of material that's used in elements like this. This suspended um, the suspended stainless steel screen. Another project with uh, urban art projects, and in this case, the architects bureau probits was the um, 2020 World Expo uh, in Dubai, the Australian Pavilion. Um, actually, have, uh, don't know uh, where that project's at in terms of the, um, the, the expo, I presume, is going to be postponed with the, um, due to COVID-19. Um, but anyway, we, we worked um, as structural engineers, we worked very closely with um, uh, urban art projects and bureau projects to, to develop this cloud type um, cloud type uh, facade, uh, which wraps around, provides the roof and the wrap to the whole building, um, and and was um, the, the the primary structure for the pavilion was designed by uh, Robert Burden Partners, and uh, we then had that an interaction uh, with them to provide um, to. Um, once we had developed the um, an affordable, workable facade, um, uh, we then um, were able to work with them to provide the support structure that was required to support this facade. Um, the project started off very ambitious with uh, uh, had these pix pixel elements which were required to connect to each other and cantilever out um, quite a long way from the supporting structure. Um, we had to do, try and develop a basic uh, facade pixel module that had sufficient strength to enable uh, discrete connection, um, as if these all of these elements were just uh, floating, uh, floating in space. Uh, and the architect was very keen to um, maintain a, a high degree of, of openness, uh, so that as you moved around the the um, as you moved around the, the pavilion, you'd get different uh, aspects of openness. Connections um, are something that we spend a lot of time looking at. We like with any structure, um, the, most of the work is involved in how elements are connected together. Uh, for, the, um, for the big hanging uh, ball, um, 
that I've showed initially, uh, we had this uh, beaten six millimeter stainless steel sphere, which needed to be connected together on site, then needed to be able to connect to this um, outer lattice grid, which then supported um, cast bronze seed elements, which are like spikes which project from the, from the supporting structure. Um, the, the whole assembly needed to be, um, it was fabricated in China, then imported to Australia, uh, and then had to be all site, site assembled. Um, the, um, a connection between the lattice elements was developed, which involved uh, bolting of, um, bolting of the, uh, each individual element to a, a node, which was enabled a, a cost effective way of assembly on site rather than a, uh, some sort of welded assembly. Um, it was a far from ideal connection, but it was, uh, it was an affordable way of, of achieving that, um, of, of achieving that connection. Um, we, uh, once again, undertook testing of the joint to, to um, because the edge distances were so small and, uh, and we needed to, um, supply some small amount of uh, moment transfer, um, uh, which could occur during the erection process, uh, before the whole outer. Uh, ladder structure was um, was combined as a uh, to form that continuous axial uh, three dimensional um, rim structure. Uh, another project below is um, called the Pod Web, and um, unlike some structures where we we uh, try and um, use the connection to uh, as as part of the the, um, the the form and the expression of the sculpture. Very often what we're trying to do is actually just um, make the connection effectively invisible um, so uh, that when it's assembled on site, it looks like it's a continuous form. Um, <coughs> over, the, um, over many years now, we've been involved with Gallery of Modern Art in, in Brisbane and, and um, the main art gallery, Queensland Art Gallery. Uh, we get involved in their big Asia Pacific Triennial exhibitions where um, where often there's very large installations that uh, fill entire spaces within the gallery. Um, uh, just demonstrated here are, are some of the different projects we've, we've worked with. Uh, many of them at GOMA, um, though not uh, structurally complex, are involved in um, just looking at the load limitations that um, the gallery uh, has to work with. It only has a, a 5 kPa floor live load, which, um, which is very low for a, a, a space such as this. And in terms of mounting things on the wall, there's a 25 millimeter plywood uh, wall skin, which uh, um, things can be suspended from. Uh, for this, things like this uh, tree down the bottom right hand side, it was a tree that was due for, uh, that was going to be uh, removed uh, from a, a residential subdivision uh, project. Um, so the tree was going to be cut down anyway. The, the artist uh, um, had the idea of, of, of taking one of these trees, um, cutting it into pieces that could be transported and then reassembling it within the gallery. Uh, for this project, we needed to uh, dismantle the whole front facade of, of entry facade at, um, at uh, Goma to enable the tree to be um, transported into the gallery. Work with moving structures and moving sculptures has been uh, has been something that's been interesting over the years, and and an area that we've uh, learnt um, to work very closely with a mechanical engineer who can develop um, bearings and um, and other moving elements of a structure. Um, it's also important to to understand when when structures move there's dynamic effects and those dynamic effects need to be accounted for in the um, in the, the the strength and stiffness of the supporting structure to avoid any um, uh, undue movement that can occur with uh, if, if the, the movement for instance these three snappers that are on support poles they wind vane and uh, wind in which is blowing from any one direction can move within uh, an arc of about plus or minus 30 degrees from that direction. And so as those, um, as those quite heavy fish elements move, as the wind changes direction, they can set up a, a dynamic frequency which needs to be thought about. 
Um, the project on the right is difficult to see what this is, but at the entry to the Powerhouse Museum in Brisbane, um, there's a suspended up in the glass atrium or glass um, pop-out entry structure is a cable net of lenses that are held within a ring. And this ring can move in three directions uh, on, a, um, on a geared structure and it's moved by people who, who, wrote, who turn a, a, um, a handle just inside the front door there. Um, for all of this type of work, we work closely with a mechanical engineer and that's also um, led into other kind of moving structures that we get involved with. For instance, this uh, flag, uh, which is to be mounted on top of the Story Bridge in Brisbane, a uh, very large flag structure uh, where a principal concern of, of the City Council was how to uh, maintain the flag and uh, any, um, uh, any elements of that flag display. So the, um, the, the main flagpole is uh, able to be uh, pulled uh, is probably uh, rotated down through use of a um, screw actuating arm, uh, which is a very useful piece of equipment, which is very uh, low maintenance, uh, can be concealed, and um, has uh, we've now used a couple of times, uh, one for a, um, a lifting bridge um, project up in Yapoon. And finally, um, when the opportunity came up for uh, Engineers Australia, Canberra Division were running a national competition to install a, a sculpture in the, in the National Arboretum in Canberra, uh, where they have a, one of the, the forest plots is, is owned by Engineers Australia. Um, they ran a competition to celebrate 100 years of Engineers Australia. Um, so uh, we felt that we really, with all our many years of work with um, working on sculpture projects, we should thought we should uh, definitely enter enter the project. Um, I visited the site down in Canberra and, and became immediately obvious that the structure, the sculpture needed to be uh, a large element that people could move in and around. Uh, there was already a sculpture on the site called Wide Brown Land, which was made out of the cursive script of uh, George, George Rie McCullough um, and I could see how popular that was for people to stand within and, and take uh, photographs. It could be read from a long distance, uh, experienced in different ways. Uh, Engineers Australia were, were looking for a um, something that was demonstrative of, of Australian technology, a celebrated Australian engineering and science and um, so the idea of, of using uh, something which was um, uh, inspired by the cochlear implant uh, seemed to be a, a good approach. Um, I worked closely with um, an architect, Nick Flutter, uh, who was at BBN at the time, um, to, and we, we used the grasshopper and rhino um, um, modeling process, which to form this, this large scale um, cochlear uh, spiraling object which was constructed out of uh, Corten steel and stainless steel. Um, but using that, that kind of modeling technique, it was, all, it, it was like uh, modeling clay with your hands, but in a much more modern approach. And uh, this, this um, also involved in the team with, um, with the artist Susan Milne and Craig Stonehouse from, from Sydney, um, who an artist that we'd done a lot of work in public art installations with. Um, the project <clears throat> won the uh, competition, but um, unfortunately is yet to be built uh, and the centenary um, of Engineers Australia has passed, but uh, National Arboretum are very keen to build the project one day. So uh, hopefully uh, the money can be found. Uh, it's costing it around $2 million. Hopefully that money can be found at some point and, uh, and this uh, structure can be, sculptural installation can be built. Um, this uh, the, this is the, some of the competition pages um, that were developed for the for the project. Um, the along you can see at the top left here, along with the the cochlear implant as being a um, an inspiration and the idea that idea of of uh, enhanced sensory experience. Um, the idea that the this sculpture would move through the the freefall pine. Uh, pin oak, sorry, uh, forest and give people different experiences of that forest and as, as they walk through 
through the sculpture. Um, uh, the other key inspiration was um, the shell form and, and particularly that kind of combination of two basic, um, uh, two basic materials being the, the core 10 steel, uh, which was then supported in that three dimensional structure through the, um, the application of, a, of a, um, stainless steel web that holds all these leaning sticks of core 10, um, in, in place. And that ends, um, this presentation.